is Mr. Coates, and this is Geology and Ecology Apes Lecture number 12. One of the things about geology is you have to think about how the planet is constructed. In order to understand how geology works, um, the construction of the planet is very important. So we have layers in the planet, and if you remember back from middle school, we have the crust is on the outside, and then underneath the crust is the mantle, and uh, the, there's a part here next to the crust uh, that includes part of the crust called the asthenosphere, and we'll get to that in a minute. Then we have the outer core, and then we have the inner core. Now, obviously, the crust is solid. It's mo made mostly of silicon minerals. The uh, mantle is also made out of mostly silicon minerals, but it is more plastic. It actually is very warm, very hot, and it's not quite molten, but it does move. It's kind of like silly putty almost. And then we get to the outer core. The outer core is liquid. It's molten, and I remember right, it's about 300,000 degrees Celsius, very hot. And then the inner core is solid again, but it's also about the same temperature. And the reason why it's solid is because all the pressure of the planet is pushing down on the core and cause it to stay as a solid rather than be a liquid. And so these are the parts of the Earth. So we have to know how these, these structures affect the outside of the Earth. All right, so if we look at the crust, we have the continents. And there's actually two types of crust. We have oceanic crust and we have continental crust. And then underneath that, we have the lithosphere, which includes both the uh, rigid part of the mantle and then the crust. And then the asthenosphere, which is the plastic part of the mantle. So these are the, going to be the layers that we're really concerned with. These other layers, although they're there, uh, we're not going to be too concerned with them because they don't really affect the outside as much as these layers do. We want to talk a little bit about the theory of continental drift. Uh, a little bit of history first. Uh, Alfred Wagner was a, a German meteorologist. He was the first one to propose the idea of that the continents had moved around, the idea of continental drift. And he basically drew some of these um, maps here that sh showed how the continents used to fit together. And he based this on the puzzle piece-like appearance of uh, the planet. And he said that over long periods of time, the continents broke apart into several pieces. And that was his theory of continental drift. And he called the large landmass to begin with Pangaea. Now, unfortunately, Alfred was kind of laughed out of the science. Even though he, w he was a meteorologist, he wasn't a geologist, and so none of the geologists at the time took him seriously. And he did have quite a lot of evidence that we'll see here a little bit more of in a minute. But um, unfortunately, no one took his theory seriously either until after he was dead, unfortunately. Most scientists support the idea of continental drift. So let's look at some of the evidence here that supports his theory. And this deals with life. So once again, we have a Pangaea back together here. And so if you look here, they got Asia and Europe and North America all kind of put together. Now, some of the evidence that he collected dealt with mineral deposits, such as coal deposits. So if we go in the northeast United States here in Virginia, West Virginia, uh, we have coal deposits. And if we link up the continents in the right manner, it links up with Europe's and Asia's coal deposits here, as well as a mountain range that's here. Uh, also, limestone deposits link up in certain areas, and salt deposits also link up. Here's a large salt deposit down here. Now, other things that occurred was uh, matching fossils. When uh, Alfred Wagner looked at the fossil evidence, he found fossils of similar organisms in South America that you find in Africa, and then similar ones in Africa that you find in India, and also down in Antarctica, actually. And there's actually plant evidence that is also very similar. In fact, they found fossils of ferns down in Antarctica, and we know that ferns require warm climates and cannot grow in colder climates. So at one time, Antarctica had to be a warmer climate. What he theorized is that over time, these continents split apart, leaving these uh, life forms stranded on the continents. This gets us to our modern day theory here. Our modern day theory is actually made up of two things. It's uh, basically the plate tectonics, how the plates move around, and also what we call seafloor spreading, which gives us the mechanism kind of for plate tectonics to occur. That was one of Wegner's major faults in his theory as well is he couldn't explain how these large pieces of solid earth were actually moving around. But the theory of 
C4 spreading kind of solve that. So the Earth is made up of all these plates that move around. And so one of the largest plate is the Pacific plate, which is this one right here. Uh, we are close to the Caribbean plate, but we are actually on the North American plate here in Florida. If we look all these edges of the plates here, there are major areas of earthquake activity and volcanic activity. So this is called the entire, this area here is the ring of fire because of all the volcanoes that occur around these edges. Also, the largest mountain range on the planet happens to occur right down this edge of the continental plates. We call that the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So these are where the major plates are. Now there are a lot of minor plates in here as well that you don't see, but uh, these are the major ones. And these numbers pertain to how fast these areas are spreading and moving. So this is 2.3 millimeters per year. This is 16.5 millimeters per year. That's quite a lot. Um, that's well over a centimeter per year movement on this area, 12 millimeters per year here. Also, this is right in the area where we have all the major earthquakes in the United States, the San Andreas Fault, which we'll see a little bit later. So let's look at the boundaries that are behind, are between all these plates, because these plates are moving over top of each other, they're crashing into each other, and they're sliding past each other. So we'll look at all those boundaries. The first boundary we'll look at is a divergent boundary. A divergent boundary, the plates are actually moving away from each other. So in this area, we have a rift valley in the middle here and then a mid-atlantic ridge or a mid-oceanic ridge here and by convections so warm magma is rising up this way and then it, the asthenosphere goes this way and basically it drags this plate with it and this plate then gets drugged this direction as this rises and it rises because of convection or warm currents in the magma basically what happens is that then we get volcanic eruptions that happen along this ridge and you have new crust that is put down as these plates spread apart. The divergent boundary is also known as a constructive boundary because we build new crust in the process of this. Now as I said earlier the largest one on the planet is the mid-Atlantic ridge, the largest mountain range on the planet. Huge goes through the entire Atlantic Ocean this is the spreading center, or the rift valley across that, and these are the mountains produced by this volcanic activity that's rising up here. And so this plate is going this direction, and this plate is going this direction. So the Atlantic Ocean is actually getting bigger, and the Pacific Ocean is actually getting smaller. The next boundary is a convergent boundary. So in this case, we have two plates, so the plate here, and it's going towards another plate, and they crash into each other. Now, depending on the types of crust, one plate might dive underneath another plate. Now, if we have continental crust like mountains on top of it, then what we'll do is get more mountains built up. And this is what's happening where India is actually crashing into Asia, forming the Himalaya Mountains, the tallest mountains in the world. And so when you have two continental crusts crash into each other because of a converger boundary, you get uplift or mountain building in that case. But in this case, we're getting subduction. This is an area of subduction here. So one plate is being thrust underneath another plate. And when this happens, you get a lot of friction down this area, so a lot of heating. And this causes volcanoes to form on the plate that's going over top of the other plate. And we also form the deepest part of the ocean in this area. These are the trenches. So one of the major ones, once again, this is the Pacific plate that's moving this way. This is the, uh, I'm not sure what plate this is up here, but it's going, this, the Pacific plate is actually going underneath this plate here. So we have a very deep trench zone in this area. And then along after that, we have all these little mountains in here, which are actually all volcanoes that are being created as the friction from the subducting plate uh, is created uh, by the, this top plate. And so we get this mountain arc, or this island arc, formed because of subduction in this region. The last type of boundary is where two plates slide past each other. Now this is uh, where we get fault lines, and fault lines where we get major earthquakes. So one of the uh, major fault lines we have in the United States here is the San Andreas Fault, and this runs through California. And so one of these plates is moving north and one is moving south. And I don't know which one's which on this particular picture. But um, 
when that happens, uh, we get earthquakes in this zone. And so this is why we have all these earthquakes in California because the major transform boundary of the San Andreas Fault that goes right through Los Angeles all the way up to San Francisco. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, that all the movement of the plates over long periods of time is responsible for some of the distribution of life on the planet. And like I said, we have fossil evidence that shows that there are similar fossils uh, on both South America and Africa, as well as India and Antarctica here. And so these animals were actually trapped on the continents as the continents separated. And as the continents moved around the globe, climate changed. So some of these, and especially like in Antarctica, the Antarctica went south and India went north. So we had climate change happening there. So because these areas went through periods of very slow climate change because the continents were moving, that means that the animals that had the right adaptations survived, and so we got different forms. This actually helped drive evolution because of the different climates that these continents went under as they moved across the globe. So this is one of the ways we can see speciation occurs because of geology. Here's another local example, or closer anyway, not necessarily local, but the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is a major geologic feature here in the United States. It was carved out by a river that flows over an uplifting plain. So the plain that the river flows over, the Colorado River, is actually slowly being uplifted. And as the plain uplifted, the river eroded down into and created this huge canyon. Before this actually happened, there was a uh, ancestral species of some ground squirrels. And so this ancestral species found itself separated as the canyon grew bigger and bigger into two sides. And so the northern rim, which is the Albert squirrel here, and then the southern rim, which is the Kabab squirrel here, got separated. And one, at one time, they were the same species. But because it took a long time to get them separated, this population could no longer interbreed with this population, and so they don't cross at all. And so they are separate species now. They even look separate, although they have some similarities, like these ear tufts. They still have these ear tufts. But uh, they are separate species, and scientists believe it's because of this geologic separation because of the, uh, caused by the Grand Canyon. Another area we can look at is the uh, snapping shrimp around Panama. At one time, the Isthmus of Panama, which is the thinnest part here of Panama, was totally underwater, and so water flowed back and forth. So organisms could move back and forth. And so you get these snapping shrimp that are genetically related to each other on opposite sides of the Isthmus of Panama. And uh, scientists believe that when the water level was higher, these were actually from one ancestral species. And as the water level receded, the two populations got separated. Different types of uh, environmental factors cause them to speciate out. Either it's a selection pressure by climate or by predators. And so you get all these different species now, snapping shrimp, that all have a common ancestor. And this is all due to geology. The last part of geology uh, relates to ecological succession. Ecological succession is the process by which a biological community rebounds after a major disturbance. Or it starts in an area where there were never life in the first place. So let's take a look at Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens uh, in 1980 erupted. And so this is the mountain before the eruption here. And this is the mountain after the eruption. This was a huge eruption. And the entire mountainside basically fell off the mountain. And you can kind of see it here. This is a uh, slide shot of actually the eruption actually starting. So the first thing that happened is that half the mountain kind of fell off here. So this is a huge area of land. We're talking millions of cubic yards of dirt. And so this started a second landslide up here. And when this second landslide occurred here, then all the pressure that was building up the mountain blew. And that's when we had the huge ash cloud that happened. And if you ever want to see any video that you can find this on YouTube, it's fairly easy to find, but it was a pretty amazing eruption, something we'd never seen in our lifetime, this big, huge eruption like this. And it totally devastated this side of uh, the mountain, and I'll get to some of that damage here in a minute. But because of this damage, this has been a huge laboratory now for ecological succession ever since it occurred back in 1980. So let's look at some of the damage and uh, the, kind of get a size of the area. 
So this is what the forest looked like afterward. All these trees had been uh, felled by the actual blast, the actual shock wave of the blast. That's how powerful it was. And then the ash fell on them afterwards to turn them this dull gray color. But we're talking hundreds of thousands of acres of trees just flattened like matchsticks. So this is a map here, and here's Mount St. Helens down here. And the blue, the eruption happened towards the north. And basically this whole area of forest was flattened by the blast. Huge area. And if we were to superimpose this over Tampa Bay, let's put this, let's put this over Tampa Bay and say that the actual mountain is right on Newsom High School. Plant City would be way over here. Downtown Tampa would be way over here and Lutz would be way up here. We're talking a huge area of destruction. Brandon would be right here. Brandon would be gone. Uh, and so this would uh, definitely be a major event here in Florida if this happened right on Newsom High School. So what happened once the uh, volcano uh, stopped erupting and the ash stopped falling and wildlife started coming back to the area? And this is what we call succession. And this, in this case, we're talking about secondary succession because we already have soil that's left behind. This is how we started after the eruption up here. All these trees are falling here. So the first thing that came in was these flowering plants here. These are called lupines. And lupines are uh, legumes. And legumes were very important in this because if you remember from the nitrogen cycle, they have the root nodules in there. And so they can bring nitrogen back into uh, the ash and start fertilizing the soil a little bit better. Now, also, if you take a time-lapse photos of the same area shortly after the eruption, and I'm not sure what the time frame is, but you start to see small little plants appear in, this, in these areas here. And I think there's a couple more up here. And then we go down to this photo down here, and we start to see a little bit more bigger plants here. We start to see uh, small trees start to pop up. And then we go to this one here, and we start to see actual pine trees. Large trees pop up in the same area. Uh, this is succession. We're going from previously lifeless soil here to more life and then eventually more until we get start gate to a forest. This graphic, we're going to look at both types of succession. The first type of succession is primary succession. Primary starts on bare rock, like a brand new volcanic island out in the middle of the ocean, for example. So we have this, this rock start off with the rock has to then get turned into soil and the way this happens is that lichens lichens are a symbiotic organism and lichen can actually live right on rocks and lichens secrete a dilute acid which slowly breaks down the rock and turns it into soil so after thousands of years of lichens living on the bare rock we start to get some soil and we start to get small plants growing in the cracks and crevices of the rock so herbs are usually some of the first ones, first green plants to show up. And as the herbs grow into the rock, they also split the rock apart and create more soil. And then also you start getting dust dropping in this area. So as more and more soil is created as time goes on. You start getting larger bushes and shrubs in this area that start to shade out some of the lichens. So our lichens start to fade out because these guys are a lot taller. Finally, we get taller trees and uh, what we call the scrub stage and these start to shade out these shrubs down here and so you don't see any on the forest floor till we get to the actual forest or the climax and okay, this would be the climax up here that's the last one that happens or the, the final result of succession is called the climax now there's a lot of debate on whether there ever is a climax because the forest is always changing but usually when you get the bigger trees that outshade all the smaller things, this is the climax of that community in a forest community. So that's primary succession. We talk about secondary succession. Secondary succession, we want to take out the bare rock part. Secondary succession occurs on soil. So if we have some kind of event that takes all the life off of the soil, say a forest fire or something like that, and we're left with bare soil, then the herbs are the first ones to come back. They are the pioneer species. Okay, in the first and primary succession, the lichens were the pioneer species. But then it'll go through the same stages all the way back up to the climax stage of succession. And so that is secondary succession when we start with soil. And sec secondary succession is much quicker than primary because we already have seeds left in the soil. We already have bacteria in the soil. And that helps the process of life return to the ecosystem. Well, I hope that was helpful for you in understanding how geology plays a role in ecology. 
Here are three comprehension questions for you. Make sure you write these down and have answers for your notes when we discuss them in small group.